Welcome to Off Panel, Sketch.com's creator-centric podcast. This week, we have a hyphenate on board as the Senior Vice President of Publicity and Marketing at Archie Comics, editor of the Dark Circle Comics line, and published novelist and comic writer Alex Segura joins the show. Thanks for coming on, Alex. Oh, thanks for having me, David. Uh, well, you know, it's been a pretty exciting week, a uh, few weeks for your team. Archie number one was about as beloved as any comic debut this year, and as the person who's most is is the most outward facing member of the Archie team. What was that response like? Oh, it was huge. I mean, uh, I, I don't think we saw any notable negativity in terms of reviews or just like social media. And uh, I think it just goes to show that if you put the right people together, like super talented people like Mark and Fiona, and and give them room to really tell a story, that you know the the product will speak to for itself. You know. It, I, I can publicize something to no end, but if the content isn't good, it's only going to go so far. Right. And, and I think one of the most fascinating things about it is, and, and I, I said this in my review, I've never read an Archie comic before besides Afterlife with Archie. But I picked up Archie number one and I loved it. And it, it's it's interesting to me, especially from your perspective as a person who works in marketing and PR, like what what were you trying to do to try and reach the people like me, the people who have never read an Archie comic before? That's a great, it's great that you picked it up having not had that background because I think a lot of people just assumed it was being created for the hardcores, which it, it wasn't. Uh, John Goldwater, our CEO and publisher, really wanted to get back to the, the root of what made Archie appealing. You know, I think over time, any any IP or property gets worn down either by continuity or like just rules that are added on. And he really wanted to get back to that kind of irreverent, funny, and also a little edgy humor that the, the strip had in the forties. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was really, you know, who better to take a property and kind of shake off the barnacles than Mark Wade, who's done that so well, you know, in traditional superhero comics, but is also a huge Archie fan. So I think the idea was that let's get to the core of what makes these characters appealing without losing the integrity of Archie or Jughead or Betty, you know, you read that book. And for me personally, as someone who has read Archie since I was a kid, I, I didn't feel like they were any different. These were those characters. It was just, we were getting some kind of new look at them. So, you know, it's stay true to the integrity of the characters, but also show them unencumbered, you know, like why are these characters so resonant? What, you know, why is Mickey Mouse so relevant? Why is, you know, uh, all these all these properties that have been around 70 plus years, why are they still resonating with people? And that, that was the idea. And I, I feel like Mark and Fiona hit it out of the park. No, absolutely. And, and I think that something that often gets lost in the translation or, you know, transition of the years is that, you know, people talk about Batman, people talk about Superman, Spider-Man, etc. And in, in a, a lot of ways, Archie is as big of an icon as those characters are. But for some reason, I, I think for the traditional, you know, the the... Marvel and DC fans, a lot of them don't look at Archie as on that level, but he really is. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's funny. The first time I went to Archie from DC, I got that question a lot. Like, well, why would you leave Batman and <laughs> Superman? And my answer was, well, to me as a kid, you know, I love Batman, Superman and Spider-Man and the X-Men and the Avengers, da, 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 da. But Archie was as big of an icon. And I think he's as recognizable. And you see that kind of play out in the press when something big happens with Archie. Oh, absolutely. Um, mainstream story, which is, you know, like anything, a double-edged sword, but it's mostly been positive. Right. I mean, I remember when you guys killed Archie, and that was Life with Archie, right? Yeah, yeah, that was that was last year, last around the same time as this one. So this is almost like the rebirth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And even then, when we did all the publicity for the death of Archie, I, I kind of thought, well, this is probably as big as it's going to get. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wrong. I think the Archie 1 stuff was even bigger. I think it just became more of less about just pure publicity and, and traffic and kind of quantifiables to just being like a cultural thing. Like, wow, they've, they've rebranded Archie and he's hot and cool and interesting. Right. As opposed to being, you know, I think a lot of people maybe at least 10 years ago saw Archie as a very retro brand, like very nostalgic. And it's really a testament to John what, and what he's done. Um, and it's been really step by step. I think it's been a long road heading to this point, you know, stuff with stuff like Afterlife or Kevin Keller, Life with Archie and all these little things he did or moved into place has really been leading up to this moment. 
Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and I, I think, you know, that was that was one of the questions I was going to ask later. But, you know, looking looking at the recent past of, of Archie comics, for me, I look at Afterlife with Archie in a weird way to be a kind of firebrand moment in your history. And it I, I'm curious, how big of an impetus do you think the success that book saw was in terms of making the Archie comics team rethink the approach of its line? I think that really just, you know, and Life with Archie was kind of a, a proto version of that because it showed the characters in a different setting in a more dramatic and soap opera-ish uh, story. But Afterlife really showed not only Archie in a different kind of story, but also in a different kind of art style. Like Francesco Francavilla came in and drew them the way he draws. You know, and it's it looks like an EC comic or a creepy comic. Totally. Uh, and, you know, but much more modern. And it was still Archie. It was still Jughead. And... Um, I think that opened the door to John and, and our president, Mike Pellerito, thinking, well, hey, maybe we can do some, we can expand on this even more. Mm -hmm. So Sabrina, and then you see it really kind of led into Archie, and then also other stuff like Dark Circle. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and I think, you know, again, as a person who never read Archie before, one of the interesting things about reading Afterlife with Archie was how... It introduced me to, I, I was aware of the characters, you know, I, I think there's like a certain broad cultural knowledge that people have of, of Archie and Betty and Veronica and Jughead and like, who doesn't love a guy who wears a crown and eats burgers all day? Uh, yeah, it's like the coolest guy. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I am, like, if there's any character that I envy in comics, number one is the Flash because he could eat burgers all the time and lose and still be losing weight. He just needs to eat the burgers <laughs> to lose the weight. Uh, or to, to be able to run. But number two would be Jughead, because he just, he seems like the best. But um, anyways, but reading Afterlife with Archie, really, like, especially with the way that Roberto wrote him, uh, or wrote all those characters, I was introduced to those characters in that book, and it was, a, it was staggering how much they made me care about them. And I think that was kind of like the book that translated into being like, okay, yeah, I'll try out this Archie number one, which is, is kind of interesting. Here because I think a lot of people just assume that the afterlife audience is people who just want to see a twist on the characters they're already into. And I think Roberto's strength is that not only is he a great horror writer, period, he just knows how to write a horror story, mm -hmm. but he loves these characters. So he knows what beats to hit with each of them. So you're instantly familiar. You don't have to really know the minute history of Archie or like know his social security number to care that to care about what's going on in the story. Yeah. And, and the thing that he did really well in that book is it was almost like a crash course on the general idea of Archie continuity in a way. It, it, it kind of, you know, introduced me to the relationships of the characters and all and how they interact and everything like that. And so for me, it was, I don't know. I mean, it, it was fascinating because like, I feel like I kind of understood the general bent of the Archie world through a comic that was effectively killing a lot of them. But yeah, it's funny because Archie for many years and, you know, still the classic digest stuff didn't have quote unquote continuity. It was very sitcomish, you know, funny things happen and then you're kind of back to the status quo for the next one and you don't have to have read, you know, double digest number 38 to understand what's going on in 42. Right. Um, so when Roberto and, and earlier when in Life with Archie, when those characters started getting put in that context where it became a serialized story, I think it filled the void that people wanted. People wanted to kind of stick around and see these characters evolve a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, which I think has been really interesting. Yeah, no, it, it definitely has been. But, you know, you, you talked about it a bit already, and it sounds like John has been a, a huge influence in the kind of changing landscape of Archie. But... You know, what was it that the team as a whole, what, what made it, made you all realize that it seemed like Archie, like the, the main flagship Archie needed to evolve for the modern era? I, you know, I think John would happily tell you this himself, but when he came into the company, I think he felt like the brand was probably a little stuck in amber, a little frozen in time. You know, it felt a little Pleasantville-y in, in mm -hmm. terms of, um, and you know, he, he came from the music business and he's very much aware of how you have to pivot and change to survive. But as someone like him who grew up with these characters, I mean, his, his dad created Archie. So, you know, having seen it all in terms, he almost grew up with these characters. Yeah. Uh, he could walk that fine balance of saying, let's do this, let's do that, but we can't cross this line. 
So he's got this dual role of, you know, innovator and caretaker, and it's a very challenging balance, I would think. Um, but he's done it really well in terms of, of, you know, I don't think people have come out and said, oh, this wouldn't happen to Archie. Uh, you know, one one thing that I really like to see, so I did receive a comment on my article, my review of Archie number one, where a person, you know, said that they'd been a longtime fan and they were, you know, a little trepidatious and they were going to be picking it up. And, you know, while they didn't love it entirely, they did reference the fact that they said that, you know, it did still, it felt like life with Archie to to them. Huh. And, and I, I thought that was interesting, but I, I think that's, you know, you were saying that life with Archie is part of like the re- revitalization to a certain degree in itself. It was, you know, partially the impetus. And uh, I don't know. I, I just, I, I'm curious, have you heard a lot from longtime fans? Like what has the response been from that side? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of the longtime fans, you know, maybe a portion of them were cautious with the new revamp and, and that's fine. And, um, but it's really one of those things where they, once they got to read the book, they were on board and I, I don't feel like they felt like anything was going away per se, because the traditional stuff, the more sitcom kind of evergreen stories are still in the digest. So nothing was really going away. It wasn't one of these things where new Archie was killing old Archie. You know, it's, it's all part of the same tapestry of things. So I think that calmed a few people down and the response overall has been super yeah, no, and, and I think that's one of the interesting things is, you know, so often we have like, you know, character deaths and character relaunches and new versions of a character in comics and things like that. And typically people are not fond of it. Like the idea of it is is something that they're a little bit more hesitant on. But a lot of it, you know, it, it really all depends on the, the execution. And, and I guess that's why it makes it so, you know, important that you had somebody like Mark Wade, who, as you said, was a fan and is just a master of revitalizing characters. And, um, and, and then Fiona Staples, who is just pretty much, I would say like the hottest artist in comics and with good reason, she's just an incredible talent. But how important do you think it was to have a pair like that to, to launch the book, es- especially Staples who, you know, uh, one of the things that I think people have come to be very comfortable with as far as Archie is concerned is it's they almost know what to expect as far as what it looks like, but Fiona's art is definitely different. Yeah, I think it was hugely important to get you know if we had kind of come out of the gate with I don't want to say middling, but with talent that didn't inspire the reaction that Mark and Fiona inspire, then it wouldn't have been seen as this big cultural event. And I think it also like like I talked about a little bit earlier, Mark was a fan. You know, I think he worked at Archie for a short time years and years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and Fiona's a huge Archie fan. I think she's noted that Archie was were the first comics she read as a kid, or one of the first. Um, so them coming in with this kind of cachet and ability, and also awareness of the tropes and what what's sacred, what isn't sacred, and what they can tinker with, um, really made for kind of you know magic. You know, it wasn't. It's not one of those things that you can really choreograph, but it worked out really well. Yeah, uh, I think also, uh, and we've kind of briefly talked about this already, but, you know, for for me, as somebody who had never read Archie comics before, seeing Mark Wade and Fiona Staples in a book, I will buy any comic that those two work on together. I, You know, Fiona by herself, I would buy any comic that she does. Yeah. But, and, and so for, you know, breaking down those walls with, like, the, you know, the more stuck in their ways comic fans who are used to like their Batmans and their Spider-Mans and things like that, you know, seeing those names on the book, that's like immediate recognition of like, okay, I guess I can try out this Archie thing. Yeah. It's a sign of quality. I mean, you, uh, fan, comic fans know the track record that these creators have. And then you pair that with an identifiable brand like Archie. And I think you bring in three, there's, you know, three circles and there's a lot of overlap there. Right. Well, you know, and, and this is probably not something you can talk about quite yet, but I know that Fiona's only on for the, the, the first three books, or the first three issues, right? Right. Now, I, I don't think you've announced who's following her up, right? We have not. You have not. It, 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 just as a general question, and you may not even be able to answer this, are you planning on trying to keep in the same style, roughly speaking, with who follows her up? Or is has that not even really been like decided, uh, I guess. You know, that's a good question. I think the, the best answer I can give you is that, you know, Fiona kind of set the tone, but sure. we wouldn't 
we wouldn't say to someone draw it like Fiona drew it. I mm -hmm. think it's it's a much grayer area. You know, you have to hit the kind of the same note, yeah. but obviously draw it in your own way. Um, what Fiona brought to the characters is she made them very vibrant and feel like they were teens from today. So I think that's the challenge to the next person and the person and whoever's after that. Um, so. Yeah, we, it's not that she's created a whole new style guide, though in a way she has. Like, obviously these are, we, you want some consistency, but we know that it's going to be a different artist, and, and that applies to anyone that's going to be drawing these books, like the new Jughead or the new Betty and Veronica. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure that if, if anyone was able to just, like, ape Fiona's style to the point where they would draw like Fiona, I'm pretty sure almost everyone would be doing it, because then they would be massive, massive stars. I know, yeah, it's just she's so unique that I don't think anyone can really match her no and personality and and if you do try to then you're really just trying to imitate so i think it's more do we want an artist who's going to come in and, and bring their own style but also make it seem consistent yeah and, and that's one of the things that i think really stood out about the first issue for me is like the storytelling was so lively and energetic like i one sequence i really there, there's two sequences in particular i really liked where um everyone was walking out of a movie theater and like everyone had their review star grades and and, oh, yeah. they, and that was just such a, a great simple visual storytelling tool and i loved how mark and, and fiona brought that to life it was just such a great little moment and then there was also that like uh when archie was introducing his dad and talking about his three passions and it just showed the three in a row and how you know he was terrible at you know working on homes or whatever and bowling but he was he picked up the guitar well and i i thought that those little elements were just just so fantastic but and i mean fun, and funny that's the thing that you know it's it's weird because when we announced the new series a, a lot or a very you know a vocal minority thought that it was going to be a grim and gritty relaunch and john in the interview made it clear that no this is going to be funny it's going to be entertaining it's going to be archie in its purest form mm -hmm. for today yeah. And I think they really knocked it, you know, they really nailed it with that. Yeah, and, and you know, one of my favorite, you know, comics as a child, or as like a kid, but also, you know, I still enjoy it to this day, was uh, Mark Wade and Humberto Ramos's run on Impulse. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, that was, you know, if anybody thinks that Mark can't write young people in an entertaining fashion, they clearly have not read Impulse, because that, in a lot of ways, is kind of like a spiritual forefather, because, I don't know, I mean, like, that was... It was just such a fun and, and young book. Yeah, Mark has a really strong voice, and he knows how to channel like different age groups or different kinds of characters, and he's got a really keen ear. And like any good writer, he listens to how people talk, and then he translates that into the characters he's writing. So, you know, I don't think you can limit what someone writes based on, you know, who they are. Sure, absolutely. And, and, and just like that, you know, I think there are a lot of artists who can bring, you know, the the inventiveness and like the uh, storytelling chops that, that Fiona has. They won't necessarily be the same style, but you know, I, I'm excited to see who the next artist will be because I'm, I'm sure it'll be fantastic or he or she will be fantastic. Yeah. I think people will be excited. Yeah. But you know, so speaking of like the other books you have Jughead coming, is, is that in October? Yeah. Uh, Jughead coming from Chip Zdarsky and Erica Henderson. The first mm -hmm. question I have to ask is how did you guys pick Chip? And, I mean, never in a million years did I ever expect to see Chip Zdarsky and Archie Comics to be in the same sentence and not be kind of uncomfortable about what I just said. I know, but it makes perfect sense. It That's does. Good. It does. Chip, you know, Chip is Jughead kind of in the way he behaves. And uh, it's funny because once we announced the Archie book, he I've known Chip a long time just through the industry. And um, he reached out and said, I'd love to do a variant cover. And I said, well, why don't, why don't you pitch on Jughead? Mm -hmm. uh, and so then put him in touch with Mike Pellerito, who's our editor-in-chief, and John, and it just became this organic thing that it just made sense to have Chip write this book because he was the only person that could really write it. Right. He's gotten the chance to riff with Mark and, and to a degree, Adam, and they've all kind of gone back and forth in, in building this, this new, new version of Riverdale, which is good. Yeah, and, and, and like you said, he is kind of like Jughead in some ways, and... One, one thing I really like about, you know, you could read his writing in, uh, you know, both Captara at, at Image, and then you could read, you know, Howard the Duck at Marvel, and, and you could see that he, you know, for, for the type of character, I think he would have a, a great voice and, and a great, you know, writing style to fit the character and, and this new, 
you know, wave of Archie comics. And I'm very excited for that. But, you know, Erica Henderson, I, I love her work. I'm a huge fan of uh, the unbeatable Squirrel Girl at Marvel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and she is, I don't know, I'm, I'm very excited to see that partnership because I, I think that for a book that ostensibly could be a humor book, I think that they're an incredible team for that. There's not really a question there. I just think that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, I think she's perfect for the book. And I think, you know, her and Chip have a really strong chemistry. Uh, I've seen only a few, you know, I've seen a few of the early designs and I think she's she's really on point. Um, it's it's kind of uh, unbelievable that we have Mark and Fiona for three issues on Archie and now we have Chip and Erica on Jughead uh, and then Adam Hughes on Betty and Veronica. It's, it's very, it's mind-blowing. Yeah. Well, and, and Adam Hughes, I mean, he's, he's known for drawing, you know, beautiful women. That's, that's the thing he does. But, you know, what made him, in, in your mind, as, as not only a person who works for Archie, but also, you know, a fan of comics, what makes Adam such a good fit for that book? Well, I think he's a great storyteller. Yeah. I think, you know, I, the most recent sequential stuff I remember him doing is, was uh, that before Watchmen, Dr. Manhattan book. Yeah. But it was really just like a thing of beauty to look at. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it reminded a lot of people that he was a, is a great sequential artist. And I know he wants to write more, and I, I know he's really really into these characters. So I think it's kind of that great mix of ability, talent, and, and fandom. You know, he knows Betty and Veronica. He really wants to tell a strong story about their friendship. And, you know, aside from whatever the main book is doing, you know, um, you have the main Archie book, which is kind of the show, the cast that features the entire cast. And then these, these other solo books will, will give you a deeper dive into their day to day. Sure. Yeah. No, and, and I, I, you know, I think it's funny that you brought up that Dr. Manhattan book because I think a lot of people passed on it because of, you know, where it was, the kind of nature of it. But that, I mean, that was, like you said, a very great reminder of how good of a storyteller he is because that was a beautiful and really, really well told comic visually. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, going all the way back to like his Justice League stuff to, or even that Star Trek OGN he did with Claremont, Dead mm-hmm. of Honor, that was He's just a really good storyteller, and I think people will be pleasantly surprised. Yeah. Now, now to take a huge jump away from that, uh, one of okay. the things I, I was talking with somebody on on Twitter about was, you know, the the distribution. And one thing that I think Archie has always had an advantage over a lot of other comic publishers is that you can find their your comics still in grocery stores and you can find them in a lot of places where you know families are or where like the average person would necessarily be and uh, according to the person i was talking to on twitter uh joe keating actually uh right. he said that he you know came across the archie number one in i believe he said a grocery store now so as far as distribution is concerned are are you is your team still making sure that this archie number one is still being distributed to those places as well? Yeah, I think it just seemed like a no-brainer. Uh, Archie, unlike a lot of our competitors, still has a really strong newsstand presence mm-hmm. and mass market presence. So, you know, if you're going to revamp your, your core characters, you know, why not give them as big a platform to succeed on as possible? Um, and that, you know, which isn't to say we're minimizing the direct market. At, not at all. I think Archie is very much a direct market book. You know, I think... Obviously, you have Mark and Fiona, and that's going to bring people into comic shops. But I think having it out there in other ways doesn't hurt. No, absolutely. And, and I actually love to see it because, you know, the, the direct market is fantastic, and they do an incredible job of, of getting product out to people. But, you know, I- anything to get a book further reach is a good thing. And I think, you know, having it in grocery stores and things like that is is really fantastic. But, you know, the the format for the book is more traditional comic sized. And that's something that I know a lot of, you know, grocery stores and things like that don't carry traditionally. So has has that been an issue at all uh, with, you know, making sure that they display it right or anything like that? Um, You know, not really. That's not, I have to be honest, it's not my area of expertise in the company, but it hasn't been an issue as far as I can tell. I think it's something where we have those spaces, so we use them. Sure, absolutely. You know, I didn't mean to be simplistic, but that's kind of the crux of it. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, w- one thing that you are related to is is there is, you know, I, I, I think there was 20 variant covers. was w- or At least, I think there was a lot. Uh, there, was a, there was a lot of uh, store, you know, retailer variants as well. Oh, yeah. So... You know what was you know what was behind that decision? Like, is is it just that's kind of what, what the market demands, or is it just you know trying to bolster the excitement for the book as a whole? 
Uh, I think it was a little bit of both. I think we wanted to show, in the same way, you know, Death of Archie had 10 variants, we wanted to show that this was even bigger than that, you know, and show different, really well-known artists taking taking a shot at, at reinterpreting Archie or showing, showing that this was a new beginning, kind of... Uh, all these iterations kind of coming together to create what this one book was. And also we wanted to incentivize retailers to participate. You know, you, you meet a third, you know, you, you hit a certain number and then you can store, which is great. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, well, okay. So another very dramatic shift, uh, moving away from Archie number one, I, you're okay. the, you're the editor of the line for dark circle comics and know. you know, you, your, your background, you're a crime novelist. You, you have an interest in, you know, maybe the more darker angles of the world. Uh, is is there a special place in your heart for that line? Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, uh, it was a huge, uh, I don't want to say incentive, but the idea of not only just overseeing the publicity, but also coming in and having some kind of editorial voice, like having a little little corner of my own was really exciting. Um, and I've always had a fondness for these characters going back to like the impact days. And even before that, I remember seeing the ads and the double digest, like showing, showing that Archie had this whole library of superheroes. I think it's just, it's really valuable for the readers, but it's also really valuable for a company to have this variety of, of properties. Um, and I just think that it's given me the opportunity to work with people I respect and admire and really let them cut loose. I'm not a, I'm not a micromanagey editor. I don't think I, I don't think that's how you get the best work out of people. I think um, you give them guideposts and say this is you know this is the space you're in. You can do whatever you want in that space, mm -hmm. um, and then you just kind of roll with it and let let creative people do their creative work as long as it resonates with what you want. Um, I think Black Hood's a really good example of that. Um, Dwayne is a really really gritty. Dwayne Swarzynski is a really gritty crime novelist and. As much as I've liked his his comic work, I, I didn't think that he'd ever gotten the chance to really kind of cut loose and just do something that was in that space. So we went back and forth, and he was into it, and and I think the end result has been really strong. The fact that we we got Michael Gatos to draw it <laughs> didn't hurt at all either. No, that's that's actually really amazing, and I've been very impressed by like the the creators you've had on that line. You know, Dean Haspiel or Haspiel. Uh, Mark Wade, Dwayne, Dwayne Swarzynski, Michael Gatos, and then you just announced, I actually think, uh, I may butcher this one, uh, Simon uh, Kudransky is an incredible yeah. artist. And and I think he'll be a great it, fit and, uh, for that line. Yeah, he's great, and it's, I think my concept overall was, you know, you don't want to seem like you're just trying to compete with everyone else. Like, uh, I, I wanted to really bring in writers that either had some experience outside of comics or brought something unique to the table. You know, uh, Frank Thierry's written video games. He's written a lot of different stuff. Dwayne's a novelist. Dave White, who's going to be doing the web, is a crime novelist. And then you have, like, Chuck Wendig, who's this huge personality and this great writer who writes in every kind of genre, and Adam Christopher, who's who's also in that boat, you know, fantasy and sci-fi. And just I want them to come at it with, with a knowledge of where they were playing, but also with that outsider mentality so it doesn't just read, like, everything else. Right. And and I know that, you know, obviously Dark Circle went through a big rebranding in the last couple of years, switching over from Red Circle. But, you know, how, how do you view Dark Circle's fit at, at, at Archie as a whole? Like, it, it's, it's a, is it an, it's an imprint technically, right? Yeah, it's an imprint in the same way that like we have Archie Horror, that's kind of where Sabrina and, and Afterlife live. Um, I think it's viewed as I don't want to speak for John, but I think he's very invested in the brand. I think it's it's not seen as something that we expect immediate and huge dividends right away. Like it's going to be a slow burn. We have to reestablish these characters that, to be frank, have been rebooted and and licensed out so many times that you know you have to almost create the definitive story out the gate out of the gate. You know, sure. Uh, and so there's. While there is some respect for continuity and what's come before and, and different iterations, I think what I've told the creators is, you know, don't feel limited by what's happened before and don't feel tied down to what you can do because in issue 27 of something that came out 20 years ago, right? you know, tells you something different. I mean, in Black Hood number one, he killed the, the, the original Black Hood is shot. Right. So that was kind of our little nod to the past showing that, you know, those stories did exist. They're not going away. But this is a whole new thing. And I think you'll see a lot. Every every book 
will have a kind of beat like that. Not mm-hmm. intentionally, it's just kind of organically happened, which is cool. Yeah, it's it's a nice passing of the torch and a, a, a good transition for the people who do know the characters, but also referential to the past for the people who are new to the book. Yeah, and you know, we, we it's also not like we're not respecting what's come before. I think digitally, we've also made a big effort to curate the past. You know, we have the impact stuff up there, a lot of the red circle stuff. We're putting out new content, new new Crusaders content, because I know there's an audience for that. So we've tried to be as responsive as possible, knowing that there's different audiences that we want to keep entertained. Um, there are people that want the older stuff. So why not make it available for the first time in years? And then we push forward on the other side with the new iterations of the, the characters. Yeah. Well, you know, from a marketing and PR standpoint, one thing I'm curious about is Dark Circle is, uh, most of it is fairly dark. And I, I'm curious if, um, from that marketing and PR standpoint, if it's tough to, for the people who would typically be interested in those types of stories, do you, do you find it tough to overcome the idea that as a umbrella, Archie is releasing these comics? Or is that a non-issue? It hasn't really felt, you know, it was an initially an issue before Black Hood 1 came out. Sure. But then there was that kind of flurry of stories saying, you know, this is the first Archie comic with an F-bomb. And, and I think once people started reading Black Hood and also started reading The Fox and realizing that Dark Circle is almost a company unto itself, like mm. under the umbrella of Archie, but um, it's doing its own thing. It's, it's not tied to, you know, they're not going to meet up with Pop Tate at the chocolate shop. It's not, it's not drawn in the same style. It's not. And while the Fox is probably the most humorous of the bunch, even that is dealing with a lot of serious stuff. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, family issues, legacy issues. It's not, it's light reading, but it's also not without substance. Um, as, as far as, these books are concerned like uh, to me it seems like having people like Dwayne and having people like Dean and you know uh, Michael Gatos I mean that's incredible it, I feel like that in itself is a really big step to and anyone who might be questioning like whether or not a good crime comic or something like that could come from from Archie like a person like Michael Gatos is a really great way to combat that and, and and I think that it, it seems like, especially with the way that you your editing style, it seems like these books are a little bit more creator first. Would you say that is the case? Yeah, I would say so. I think um, there's definitely back and forth. I don't want to make it seem like they just send in a script and it becomes a comic, but um, it is, <laughs> you know, it is about letting them do what they do best. Because you know, who am I to tell Dwayne how to write a crime story? All I can tell him is maybe you want to tweak this, or maybe this reads weird. Um, and the same with Michael, you know, he's such a great artist and so he can evoke mood so well, like his just camera angles and, and panel repetitions or how he lays out the page. Um, so it is com- it's like its own studio where, where, you know, you're letting the talent really cut loose and also be excited. I, I feel like they're all excited about what they're working on. They could just be tricking me, but, it, you know, they seem really into it, mm-hmm. which usually in my experience leads to good work. So. No, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I think everyone feels like they can do their best work if they're, you know, given the tools and the, uh, you know, the freedom to, to do what they think is best. And, you know, like you said, like, it's not like they're sending an email in and then it just goes to a printer and starts running. Right. Uh, but, you know, at, at the same time, it, having that freedom at the start can definitely enhance their ability to do their best work. So th- that, and I think also they're not beholden to each other. I mean in theory or technically all these books are happening in the same quote unquote universe, but something happening in the shield isn't going to affect the black hood unless the writer of the black hood wants it to, Sure, you know, um, I don't think there'll be a point where you see, you know, the shield, the black hood, the Fox, the web just decide to team up and become the crusaders. Cause I think each of those books are so unique that it would be weird. Mm-hmm. It would be weird to have someone with superpowers show up in the black hood. Um, for example. So no event comics? Uh, yeah, I mean, there, if, if there is any kind of event, it wouldn't be the way you've seen it before. It'd be more story-driven, probably. Exactly. Yeah. 
Okay, now, one thing I have to ask about, just because I find, you know, conceptually it seems so odd to me, but, like, a lot of people have been raving about it. Like, you guys love doing the the Archie Meets, like, series. Like, I, I think there's Archie Meets the Predator right now. And I've seen yeah. a, a lot of people say really great things about it. And, you know, granted, you guys have, you know, great creators on there. But you're going to be writing Archie Meets the Ramones, or Archie Meets Ramones. Yeah. Where did those books come from? Like, I, I, I guess conceptually, like, how did those start coming together? And, like, uh, what has the response been? I'm very, very curious about those books. It's funny, yeah. I mean, way back when, as you probably remember, we did Archie Meets the Punisher. And that was mm -hmm. years and years ago, before my time. Um, and it, it kind of went quiet after that. And, and uh, not until a couple of years ago, when, when John said, you know, Gene Simmons is interested in doing an Archie Kiss comic. Um, and that be, was, you know, that sounds bizarre and surreal, but also kind of awesome. cool. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I threw my hat into the ring for that and Archie meets kiss became this bizarre trippy thing, which I had a lot of fun working on. I think Dan Perrin had a fun time drawing it and, you know, also was as a byproduct were some of the most bizarre moments of my life, like signing comics with Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley at meltdown and <laughs> signing with Gene at San Diego. And, you know, it just, it was one of those weird things where you're like, this is my life. Right. Uh, but, and then that kind of opened the door for other things. You know, that was actually Francesco's first work. Francesco's first Archie work was doing those covers for Archie Kiss. Mm -hmm. and that got him in the door. And that really was, you know, the beginning of the Archie Meets stuff. You, we had Archie Meets Glee soon after. And then that evolved into Archie versus Predator and Archie versus Sharknado. And now Archie Meets Ramones. So, you know, it's, it's just the idea of putting Archie in these unexpected situations and, and similar to Afterlife, if not in execution, then just theoretically, like these characters are still these characters, even if you put them in weird situations, it's still Archie. Um, I think the, the Predator stuff is most interesting is it's because it's drawn also in the Archie style by one of our classic artists, Fernando Ruiz. Um, so it's it's not off putting, but it's also surprising. Yeah, no, absolutely, and and I think you know the Archie meets the Punisher thing. I, I think it's funny because that that's one of those like kind of oddball like legacy books that you know people intermittently bring up, being like, "Can you believe that?" Or, or people will bring up when they're saying things like, "Can you believe that that actually happened?" But you know, it, it seems like the response has been you know very positive, and I, I have to admit, I, I'm. I, I was going to get the uh, Archie versus the Predator book on, you know, in trade just because I, that's one of those things that as a uh, fan of the Predator, it's just, yeah. it's so unexpected that I kind of feel like I have to experience it. And I, well, I guess, I guess that's kind of what you're going for. Yeah. It's kind of that hitting that note where, you know, the Archie fans will get into it because it's Archie in a different light, but then also the fans of these other properties are intrigued because, it's new new products featuring their favorite properties. I mean, I met so many Kiss fans when we did Archie Meets Kiss and people who were not Archie fans but bought it because it was, you know, Kiss and comics have a long history together. Yeah. The same way the Ramones do, in you know, a little differently. But the idea of opening up your properties to new audiences, I think, is the business impetus. But then, you know, if the story isn't good, then you failed in the execution. So the idea is tell a fun, wacky story um, of these two things interacting and hopefully it'll come out, you know, as greater than the two pieces. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think it's funny that we're talking about this today, given the fact that I, I work at an advertising agency and I was talking to one of my coworkers and, you know, it's casual Friday. We're recording this on okay. Friday, by the way. Uh, and she was wearing a kiss shirt <laughs> And, you know, I, she, like, is kind of, like, one of those casual comic fans that might actually pick up something like that just because she's like, Kiss is in a comic? I gotta get this. Yeah, it's the kind of thing that pulls people in that maybe aren't into, in the weeds, you know, that aren't, like, Wednesday Warriors or they're all, you know, that into what goes on in comics, but they're intrigued by the idea. And everyone knows Archie, you know, in the same way, like, beyond just comics, but just as a pop culture thing. Mm -hmm. No, Absolutely. Uh, so th this is more of a broad question, but you know we we're, were talking about bringing in those fans that aren't traditional fans. But for you as a person who works in marketing and PR and someone who's been doing this for years, what do you find to be the most important elements to promoting comics are? 
the most important elements of the comics. Uh, no, no, like it, it, when you're trying to promote a comic, you oh, know, the act of promoting. Yeah, um, when, you, when you're trying to promote it, like what is it that you find to be the most impactful when you're trying to gain an audience for a book? Well, I think the trick, uh, and I'm minimizing it by calling it a trick, but I think the idea is trying to be as aware of what your audience is for whatever you're trying to promote. You know, if if I'm announcing a variant cover or something that's very kind of inside baseball, it doesn't, it loses its value if I do it in a different kind of outlet. You know, if I, you know, there's different stories for different outlets, there's different ways to tell a story. Uh, and, and then each of those pieces become a narrative and you have to kind of map out your narrative before, and I'm getting way in the weeds here kind of, but you have to map out your narrative before you can even start. You have to know where you're going to end, you know, mm -hmm. what's, what's the reveal going to be when the book's on sale? Like, and who are you going to hit when the book comes out? And then what are the other beats? Because comics have a, an interesting cycle that's different from other forms of publishing. You know, we basically say what we're going to do three months ahead of when we do it. Mm -hmm. um, and that used to be very retailer centric. It used to be something that didn't go public. I think maybe 10, 15 years ago or, or before wizard existed. Yeah. Um, but now that's a publicity beat now showing those covers and you're, you're basically choreographing what you're going to do three months in advance. And then you have to also parcel that out. So you still have stuff to talk about for the customers, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting. It's a, it's like putting a puzzle together every day. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and, and I'm just to say, I'm totally fine getting in the weeds because this stuff is super fascinating to me, but I, I always find that to be one of the most, most, Interesting and potentially, I guess, unenviable things for somebody in your position is trying to sustain that excitement for, you know, from that three month period when it first gets announced or first goes into previews to the final order cutoff date, which is three weeks out and it's the last time retailers can alter their orders. Right. Uh, like trying trying to sustain energy and encourage pre orders without becoming this person who's just constantly talking about things. I have to imagine that can be, you know, is that a struggle to try to find the right balance? Uh, it is, and it's also knowing it's it's different volumes. I mean, there's certain things you want on full blast at certain times, and then there are other. It's you prioritize. Like, what are our priorities on a given month? Like, you know, this previews month. What are the things that we have to really hammer, and, and when should we hammer them? Right. Um, that's the challenge, and I think. Um, you don't want to minimize anything by saying, oh, this is a priority and this isn't, but you also know, I mean, that's just not the way of the world. There are certain things that you have to focus on more than others. So I think the challenge is knowing when to beat the drum and how loud and knowing if you can come back and beat the drum again. Yeah. No, no. And, and, and I think that, you know, something you said in the previous answer is, is very interesting because you said like, you know, you got to know your audience announcing a variant isn't necessarily the right, you know, you, you don't necessarily want to announce a variant cover with like USA Today or something like that. But I, I think right. Archie, the, the relaunch got announced in the New York Times, right? On their website. Right. And, you, you know, how important... It was in print. It was in print. <laughs> oh, it was in print, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, how important was that to like, you know, did you guys have like, did you have deliberations as to where the right place to reveal that would be is? Or, or is that something, you know, you just kind of had an idea from the start? Um, I had conversations. We, uh, we always have internal conversations. Usually it's John and, and Mike and myself. And um, they're, think, they're, you know, they're very deferential to just my experience and what have we've done before. So I, I feel like Archie's got a good track record in terms of how we roll out information. Um, but something like that, it was very thoughtfully done in that it was such a pivotal moment for the company that we couldn't have just announced it as what it was. We can just be like, hey, there's this new book coming out. It had to be told in the context of what it meant for the brand, you know, like, and then we got to mention other things like the Riverdale show and, mm -hmm. and you know, it, it, it was positioned as a mo as a moment for the company, which didn't close the door on us talking about it as a book in other places, but that seemed like the right way to get it off the ground. Absolutely. Cause then, you know, it, New York times is a, a great Avenue for potential, crossover readers and then beyond that it seems to me that like you know like we talked earlier the the cultural awareness of archie is is probably far greater than most people realize and so something like archie being relaunched is a, a great fit for the new york times audience because there's probably people who at some point have read it 
all over their, their subscriber list. Yeah, and it reminds those people or people that have kind of moved on or are reading other things that the company is still around, that the book is still coming out, and now is a great time if you're going to come back. You know, what better time? And then the issue with that also, the timeline you deal with is that the book is three months away because obviously we had to announce it before solicits. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just juggling those different kinds of deadlines and knowing when those beats are needed. Yeah. I have to say, one of the odder moments in in my comic reading, you know, reading about comics history was uh, reading an article on Pitchfork about your Archie meets Ramones comics. I didn't. How bizarre is that? Yeah, I, I, sorry, it's go so ahead. crazy. No, it's it's funny because I'm in a band or I played in bands before, and if you told me that that's how I would get onto Pitchfork, I mean, I probably would have believed you just because we haven't practiced in like forever, but. <laughs> You know, it was just bizarre because it was also like on Brooklyn Vegan and a bunch of other blogs that I read for pleasure just to know about music and what's going on. Um, yeah, that got a lot of that got legs. And it, I think it was really a byproduct of momentum. You know, we started that week so strong with Archie One mm -hmm. and then we hit, it, we hit again with the Riverdale news. Um, and I think that kind of positioned us differently, whereas before we were seen as really just this smaller publishing company it showed that we're you know the portfolio is much bigger we have we have tv stuff going on and then we have partnerships like this with the ramones so it made for a really strong san diego but it, yeah it was really bizarre to see my name and and giselle's name and matt's name in pitchfork yeah yeah i i i i don't read them all the time but i when i saw that i was like wow i i did i did not expect that but you know that's as somebody who's a veteran of, of, of the comic industry in, in many different capacities, but most recently marketing and PR. Um, have you found that as far as reaching more mainstream audiences on websites and newspapers and things like that, that your job has gotten easier in the past five to 10 years? Uh, hmm. I don't think it ever gets easier. I think it's different. I yeah. think, I think maybe 10 years ago, there wasn't the same level of awareness. You still saw a lot of, bam, wow, comics aren't for kids anymore. Type <laughs> so many articles called that. Yeah, and, and that's fine. That's just, and now reporters are much smarter about their knowledge of things like that. I mean, places have reporters dedicated to comics or dedicated to pop culture things. Um, so I think it's easier in that there's more people that want to talk about it. Um, but then in terms of publicity, it's you have to decide how you want the stuff to be discussed at where. Um, so that challenge hasn't changed. No, absolutely. And it, it, I think yeah, you have more opportunity. You have more openings. There are more places to talk about it. But you still have to figure out, well, how do I want it to be talked about? Right. And even beyond that, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that there's more noise than ever. And it's, it's hard to get... You know, like getting Pitchfork to pay attention to something like that is big, especially given the fact that, you know, b before we started recording, we were talking about, you know, kind of the year round news cycle. And, in you know, for music, it is certainly no different. And yeah. I don't know. I mean, being able to, to make a crack into their world is, you know, an, an achievement of itself. But it's it, it like I said, it was definitely surreal seeing that, and especially for you. Yeah, no, it was really cool, and it's you're right. There is a level of noise. You know, everyone wants to be at the top of the pile. Everyone wants you to see whatever they're working on immediately. And I wish there was a solution to just get it to the top of the pile, but there isn't. So, you know, it really it's just got to be a confluence of you as a publicist doing the right things, like hitting the right notes, and then a lot of it. A part a part of it is also luck. You just sometimes there are things out of your control that hit that make your story not matter, and. Um, that's that's something you can't change. But luckily, with stuff like RG One and and the last even even last the last few weeks was a challenge because it's San Diego. So RG right. One came out the first day of San Diego, and I I think we were very lucky that the other two announcements kind of cut through that noise and made it up to a bigger a higher height almost. You know, kind of cleared that cloud um, because there was so much stuff always being announced at San Diego that you know usually I I avoid announcing at the show because everything gets lost. But yeah. I feel like a few of the things we did announce had the legs to go beyond. And I mean, seeing something like Archie Ramones on Pitchfork validates that to some degree. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you're exactly right about San Diego. It, it is kind of, I, I guess this year is a little bit calmer in the sense that like only a few huge movies were there. 
Right. But at the same time, that there was still just like a staggering amount of stuff that came out of there. I mean, I I was actually kind of shocked by how few articles I saw looking at like you know Vertigo bringing out twelve new books and like even like Raina Telgemeier announcing a new book. You didn't see that really popping up too too many places. And those are those are big big things. And so it it can be very difficult to crack into the audience. I'm pretty sure if you do find a way to get to the top of the pile, though, Alex, you will be a very rich man. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the guaranteed formula. If I figure it out, I will not let you know. But <laughs> good call. Don't tell anyone. Yeah. Uh, so the last question I have for you, and this one's kind of broad, but you know, th- there's a lot of big things happening. You know, the Archie reboot has been successful. You have Afterlife with Archie and Sabrina being you know successful with the horror line. Same with the Dark Circle, a Riverdale TV show coming up, and all kinds of other things. To you, what is the future? What what does the Archie of tomorrow look like? Hmm. That is a, that's a good question. I think you know the way John has built the company, he's really pushing it towards shaking off a lot of the dust that it had collected over the decades and really becoming a true like multi-platform, multi, you know, multimedia company. You know, with stuff like Riverdale and you know whatever other media is in the works, I think you'll see Archie kind of develop into a multi-tiered place, um, Mm -hmm. probably sooner rather than later. And I I think the publishing is always going to be important, but I I think there's a lot of room for the company to grow. I think uh, a lot of for many years, Archie surprised a lot of people. And now I'm seeing that people are less surprised, not in a bad way, because people now have come to expect a level of quality or a level of progressiveness and you know excitability which is good and i think that opens a lot of doors yeah i i think the first step was to get people like me to accept you know everything that was going on that that like this is you know this is the new way this this is you know kind of what archie is now and you know like you said like i expect to pick up archie number two and love it and that you know that was a, a sentence i probably didn't expect to say a month ago but you know, I'm, I'm much happier that it is the case. Yeah, no, that's great to hear, you know, and that, that's what we wanted. We wanted, we wanted the core fans obviously to love it, which, uh, which I think they did. And then we wanted it to serve as a great springboard to new readers. Um, and that's really a testament to Mark and Fiona. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Alex. I really appreciate it. And, you know, best of luck with the, I'm sure, busy, busy times you have coming up. Yeah, no, thanks so much. This was fun. It was a really engaging chat. So thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Off Panel from Sketch.com. You can find our guest, Alex Segura, online at alexsegura.com and on Twitter at Alex underscore Segura. Follow Sketched on Twitter at Sketched Comic and visit our site at Sketched, that's S-K-T-C-H-D dot com. And join us next week for another episode.